Okay, so I think we'll just make a start if everyone's happy. If people join, we can obviously let them in as we go. But um, yeah, great. So today we've got um, Linda with us. Um, oh, having the same problem as how do I change this slide? There we go. <laughs> okay. So yeah, Linda's going to be doing the presentation today, but first of all, just a couple of things to note. As always, the session is being recorded and that will be uploaded to the website for you to recap or people to join who weren't able to make it today, um, usually within um, a couple of days, um, but there will be a post on the website when that's been done. Um, yeah, if, if you wanted to um, kind of in interact anywhere or um, have a comment, if you'd like to use your microphone, then you can do that. But then if you use your raise hand function i think it's at the bottom of the screen under reactions we can um you'll be bumped to the top we can see that you've got a question and then we can unmute you and linda will answer but there is going to be a q a um part at the end of this as well perfect yeah and then as always again feel free to comment in the chat box either as chloe said to ask questions to linda or just have discussions amongst yourselves and um, that's there for you guys to use okay so over to Linda, if you wanted to start. Okay, so this is not going to be an elaborate presentation by any means. I've just got a few slides. Um, the main purpose of which is to keep everyone updated and informed about changes that are happening. Um, now, in some ways, Axia prides itself on being an organisation that is constantly changing. Um, trying to keep up with current research and evidence. Um, and when I say evidence, I mean from autistic people and their families, as well as evidence that might be in peer-reviewed journal articles, for example. We also recognise that change is something that um, lots of us find difficult for a number of reasons. Um, autistic people, because if you can't predict that's a scary place to be. For dyspraxic people, it can be that you have to rethink how you're gonna organize yourself. Um, and it, it goes across all the neurodiversities because it does impact on what I call executive functioning as well, which is your planning and organization. So any change means um, a rethink of how you do things. You had the presentation from Chloe and Evie, a mini one as we called it, um, very recently, regarding how we're trying to improve our process, helping people fill in the developmental history questionnaire, which we recognise is a, a big document. It's a complicated document, and it's not just about facts. There's a lot of emotion attached to completing a developmental history questionnaire, particularly if there's been trauma in your life or your child's life, and you have to recall that. Um, and seeing things written down can, can be very different from when you just think about them. So Evie and Chloe are there if people are struggling for whatever reason, and you don't have to tell us what that reason is, um, but, but they're there to help you fill that in because it is a very important part of the diagnostic process and it helps our clinicians arrive at the correct conclusion, the proper assessment of what you and your family and friends need from us. You'll also be aware that we've changed our logo. You saw that at the beginning there, and um, that's been a, a huge event, which has been really exciting. That's um, been a collective um, co-production with um, the members of what we call the Axia Collective, and um, I think we've mentioned this before, but the Axia Collective are um, a collection of people who represent different parts of Axia's organisation. And we come together fortnightly to look at everything from research to books to um, which training events we should be going to. And we did look at the logo. Now, the, the logo um Axia when it was first um thought up back in 1998 by Calvin's dad my partner he had a logo that was quite different from um the logo that we've been using for a while 
we also desperately wanted to get away from ASD uh, for the horrible word disorder. It's, as you all know, we don't like that. Um, we have to have that in our entry at company's house because there's already an axia. Um, and so we had to have something in addition. So the Axia Collective tried to look at the very old logo, which was pointed out to us that the colours used were pretty similar to eBay. So clearly that wasn't an option for us. And we've gone for some quite, I think, lovely colours, really, quite muted colours that retains a little bit of the purple of Axia, but is very much um, going back to the old logo. I'll move us on to the next slide, please. So we need to give you some structure, routine and predictability. What I'm gonna to do today in particular is to talk with you about our new premises. And we want to celebrate this, but we recognize this is a massive change. Um, and it will affect those of you that have got appointments coming up with us and those of you that um, are familiar with um, Red Hill House, for example, and may have um, some very positive things to say about Red Hill House, and that might be a loss, which we're going to explore. So we want everyone to feel safe in the change, in the move. And we do recognise there's a need for structure and predictability. And um, we're obviously needing to do that with our own staff, as this is a big upheaval for them, that they will be moving. And um, that presents all sorts of positives and negatives for our staff. And we're trying to keep our staff updated at every point that we can. Our facilities manager, Bev Lonergan is in charge of um, getting the new premises up and running and the move and is trying to liaise with the relevant people so everyone feels safe and listened to. With people external, um, we are using the usual channels such as email and uh, Zoom and so on. And obviously with the likes of yourself, we will be updating you through the post-diagnostic support group. And it might be that if there's something to announce that we might add that on to somebody else's presentation. Next slide, please. Now, this is the transition curve, which I know for people who work with me, they'll know I keep going on about this curve. I find it a useful curve to look at, both in any changes that are happening in my life, both personally and professionally. There are many other similar models out there, and it's important that you choose a model that uh, helps you and makes sense to you. The, the reason that I like it is it, it not only um, lets you know where you might be in the transition, and this is a transition curve for any change in your life where you need to behave differently. There are models out there, for example, bereavement models that also look at stages of change. It's important that you recognise that um, at different points in the transition curve, we all need different things. And one of the reasons we um, include this now in our information pack, which goes to everybody, and our information pack, which we are reviewing and we are um, adding to, um, is that everything that anybody needs to know about Axia prior to coming to the appointment and, and after the appointment. So the transition curve can be helpful where different family members, friends and so on, or colleagues um, are at different stages in the process. So if somebody's in the very early stages, uh, they need something very different than people who are, say, for example, at stage seven, where everything's making sense and they've changed some behaviours and 
the transition is almost at an end. But of course, anything can knock us right back to the beginning. So it may look like we've managed a transition and then something which might to other people seem very small knocks us right back to the beginning. Now, we're looking at this transition curve as we're moving from Red Hill House to our new premises. Now, at the moment, um, there's so much building work going on, which I can talk about in a moment, that no one has moved. Um, and uh, we want to try and make sure that we all move together. And that probably will be at least another couple of months as we want that to be a positive move where we all go together. Next slide, please. Okay, these are some of the photos that um, Dream took when um, we went to visit the property on receipt of the keys. So the there's the aerial view of the property, which is, I'm useless at this sort of thing, but I'm sure there are other people who are looking at this now who can make perfect sense of how many buildings there are and um, roughly what size they are. I can't see anything other than some lines. The picture below it shows the main house and what is currently transitioning from being a garage to being the admin block. I don't want you to think we're putting our admin team in a garage. Our admin team are absolutely fundamental to the organisation. They're the first point of contact. And we all know that if the first point of contact is not a positive one, we often don't proceed with that organisation. So the garage will be turned into a proper um, place for the admin team to carry out their work, but also to relax and have breaks in the room upstairs. The main house is where the bulk of the diagnoses will go on. And um, there are at least five diagnostic rooms in the premises. We're gonna be having a much larger family room that we think will really benefit families so that children can be even more able to relax and, and move around than they are at Red Hill House. We also have a um, downstairs clinic room, which we have a, in the process now of getting fully disabled um, wet room, bathroom and so on so that that was fully accessible for anybody who might need a disabled access toilet. There are um, waiting areas, and we're also currently having a properly made bookcase, which will be for people to be able to lend books. Um, and also we're going to be having a load of leaflets there for people to take away. Um, and things like our alert cards and so on will all be visible and available. There will also be on the bottom floor, um, Calvin, my co-director, will be um, not only having his own um, space there, but also there will be um, really good space for people to hang out with. Calvin's currently looking at sort of retro gaming space and so on. But this can be a space where um, when we get back up and running with, for example, open room, that people can come and hang out. But also it might be at the moment, if somebody's finding the assessment either boring or stressful, that sometimes um, young people might want to move out of the session, for example, if their parents are talking. And that this will give us more space. There's also, as you can see from the, the top, you can see there's a lot of land. Um, now, clearly we want, car parking is fundamental. People will be able to park in the premises. The gates will be open and you'll be able to drive in and park your cars there. The staff will have plenty of car parking space. And 
Um, there will be some outside areas. We're hoping to have a sensory garden area, um, an arts and crafts area, and some space for people if they just want to sit, maybe have lunch and so on. There's also going to be um, a room that we're currently um, calling the therapy room, which is a room that you can't actually see in, in these um, pictures. It's almost opposite the admin room, but way over past the out the buildings that you can see there. And that will be a space where people can come in quite confidentially without having to come into the main building that they can go straight to the therapy room. Again, another exciting development. The picture below shows myself, Calvin, and our facilities manager, Bev, in the kitchen area. And uh, this is the kitchen that Calvin has dreamed of. Um, people who know Calvin from the old post-diagnostic support group will know that he um, always did um, cakes for the group. And we're going to be expecting things from Calvin in this kitchen as it is now his state-of-the-art kitchen. Um, Calvin may want to say something about that um, later in the presentation. The other thing we're going to be very much doing is engaging with the local community. We haven't been able to really do that at Red Hill House. Um, we tend, once we're in our rooms at Red Hill House, we tend to stay in them. And that, of course, is important for the security of the building that we're in. And I have to say the people at Red Hill House have been absolutely amazing to us, both when the pandemic hit and throughout, and now helping us with the move. So we have nothing but praise for um, the the staff at Red Hill House. The local community will be important for us to liaise with, and Bev has already made some links with the um, Village Hall, for example. Um, Evie and Chloe have made some links with um, Crabwall Manor, where our admin team are going to be having a much needed and much um, anticipated away day tomorrow so that they can help prepare for all of the changes that are happening at Axia. We're also next door to the Wheat Chief pub, and we will be talking to them to um, talk about maybe families going there either before their appointment or going there if they're waiting um, an outcome from an appointment or indeed after the appointment. We're also very near Cheshire Oaks, which is a huge chopping shopping, sorry, shopping, maybe shopping, shopping centre. Um, and uh, we've also made some links with um, the David Lloyd um, gym and swimming pool. So if those of you who've got David Lloyd memberships elsewhere, you uh, can probably use that when you come to see us. So we feel it's a good time as well to just raise the profile uh, within the local community which it might look very rural, and in fact, we do back onto a farm, um, but we are very close to um, the main part of Chester. Next slide, please. So we're currently booking in to um, April, and um, it could be that your appointment may be at the new premises. We are going to make sure that if that is the case, you will see photos of the new rooms and Dream is our photographer and we'll be um, updating on the website any changes uh, as they occur. As I say at the moment, the building work is just so much that it wouldn't really be of any use to people, um, it would just look a bit like a bomb site. Uh, we will also obviously be changing the directions and Bev Facilities Manager has been um, looking at um, bus routes, the nearest um, train station and so on. And there is actually a King Cabs, which is the major taxi company in Chester next door to the premises. 
So we will let you know. Our Meet the Team page um, will remain. Um, obviously, you know, there are changes to our staffing and um, also we're trying to make sure that our photos of people keep as up to date as possible. But that will remain a static. That will not be changing. We're trying to ensure a smooth transition to the new premises. Next slide. Okay, this is um, in some ways nothing to do with um, the move to the new premises, but is a major change that is happening currently. And um, I thought it important to clarify with people our position on right to choose. Now, right to choose has been under various names and guises, has been around for quite some time. It was originally started so that people could choose which hospital, for example, that they went to for various operations, and they would be able to see, for example, the success rate of surgeons and so on. Although this is a complicated affair because if you're a surgeon that gets is highly skilled, you often get the most complicated cases and therefore may not have the highest success rate, but it may be the highest success rate for your particular condition. So it isn't as simple, even with just picking where you might go for a hospital appointment. Now, in relation to neurodevelopmental assessments, that has not been clear and indeed remains somewhat unclear. We've spent some considerable time looking at government um, articles and statements, NHS statements, and uh, other organisations that have been linked on our website and trying to give advice to people. We have been inundated with right to choose referrals. And with a, a few people, we've been quite concerned that they've been referred to us without maybe um, fully understanding why they've been referred to us. It feels like it was seen as quite a good idea and a refer referral has been made. And this is quite different from any other referrals we've got where people spend quite some time thinking about uh, whether they want to come to us are often having to jump through lots of um, barriers in order to get to us. Our position at this point in time is that we are happy to take right to choose referrals for adults seeking autism diagnoses. This is because our NHS contract with Salford and Bolton is for adult autism diagnoses, and that is our NHS contract. And we feel it's important that that is linked directly with right to choose. If you'd like some more clarification, we can send that to you if you're thinking of right to choose. And you can, of course, um, contact your local clinical commissioning group regarding their stance on right to choose, which varies enormously from clinical commissioning, commissioning group to cl clinical commissioning group. I think that's all I wanted to say. I, I would prefer that we had questions and answers about the presentation, but also I'm more than happy to take any questions that you would like, and a question was posed to me um, yesterday, which I would very much like to address um, before the end of this session. So, Evie, Chloe, over to you to try and get some sort of dialogue going, if it's all possible. If you do have any comments or questions to pop them in the chat box now, um, we were just saying that there was one off Carl basically saying that with in that photo of you all in the kitchen that in his coat, and I think he was a bit blurry, looks a bit like a ghost. Um, <laughs> other than that, other than that <laughs> uh, I don't know whether we want to have a bit of a break now and then if people do have any comments, we can yeah. come in and come back and do like a, a large Q&A section or... Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, so people can go and have a think. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's it's about half past now. So if we say yes. we're going to come back about quarter to. Lovely. That sound all right? Yeah, look forward to it. And honestly, anyone throw any question you like at me. If I don't know the answer, we'll uh, try and find out the answer. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be about what was just spoken about. Yeah. I'm sure if, if there's anything people want Absolutely. to know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so see everyone at one forty-five. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, sorry, just, just to recap that question, it was just about um, updates for the PDSG, where that's going to be and how that's going to be run sort of going forward. OK, so um, we're going to be um, hopefully doing what we're calling a hybrid model, which will be some uh, people will be there in person and some people will be joining virtually. We feel this is the best model so that people who um, can't get there, don't want to get there, or geographically, you know, it's, they're so far away that it's impossible, that they will still be able to join us virtually in the way we're doing today, um, but that, that we'll also have um, face-to-face because we recognise that there are a lot of people who um, like that, prefer that, um, we it probably won't be at the new premises if we're in 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 the old days in inverted commas we often had upwards of 50 people actually coming to the lifestyle center in crew and um, given that we have got people who you know bc before covid actually wanted to socially distance anyway that it's going to have to be a pretty big venue if if that is the number that we're looking at so again, as part of being part of the local community, we're looking at things like the village hall. Um, Evie and Chloe, you're going to Crab Wall Manor on Thursday, aren't you? And it might be worth you sort of scope in there to see, yep. um, see what you think of the venue and also what, what have they got. So we're in the early stages of just trying to think about um, what might be a suitable venue but it probably won't be at the new premises unless of course there's only a few people who uh want to actually um come physically in which case yeah we could but i think in anticipation of how it was before we'll probably need a local venue and uh do the combined so that people can also join virtually okay great i think that's that sounds like that one. Yeah, so someone's just put that both virtual and face-to-face -face sounds great. We're still oh, going to have to um, think about the logistics behind it of things like, you know, where the laptop's going to go so that pe whether people can see it. Yeah. And, you know, so you don't want people to feel neglected if they're not physically there as well. So, yeah. so th we are trying to think about everything and make everyone happy, but we'll, we'll let you know as soon as we come up with things as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you want to do that one that was emailed to us? Yes. Yeah. So there was a question that came through by email. Let me just pull this up. Um, okay. So it's quite a long one, but I'll just read it out as it is. And then, um, okay. So it says, I sometimes experience shutdowns and, and sometimes these are at work. I'm not sure how I would react if, for example, I had a shutdown at work and the fire alarm went off during the shutdown. I'm not sure if I would get a rush of adrenaline and be able to react appropriately or not. I've asked this question in a few online forums for autistic people to see if anyone has experience, but I don't have an answer yet. Is there any research that could help or just general advice? OK, um, I don't think it's so much research that is um, going to be helpful here. I think this is more from uh, health and safety perspective so in any organization you um people need to have completed and i think evie and chloe you recently completed some paperwork around um evacuating premises mm -hmm. and so there is in terms of health and safety and we can get you the links well i'll get Bev to give you links uh, later down the line, at Chloe and Eve, if you could organise that for me, that there are forms that have to be filled in to help people evacuate premises. Now, you don't have to disclose a diagnosis at all. So, for example, it could be that 
you have got a broken leg at this point in time. And if the fire alarm went off, you would need a chaperone, as they're called, um, to help you uh, get out of the premises. Also, there may be people who, for example, um, use the lift. And because lifts are out of action when the fire alarm goes off, that they're going to need special help to evacuate the premises. So I think the best way of dealing with this would be to make your employer aware and ask them about their evacuation procedures, because that should be done for all staff as to who might need what help. And that can vary. Um, so some people might have, uh, for example, fibromyalgia, that on some occasions they could evacuate the premises without any help, but on other occasions they would need a chaperone. So I think this is about health and safety legislation and um, employers having proper evacuation procedures. Obviously, if you have disclosed to your employer that you're autistic, that would be part of your reasonable adjustments. I think we don't want to second guess how someone is going to react to a fire alarm. Um, it could be that somebody freezes and um, that would be, you know, we got fight, flight and freeze. So it could be that the person freezes and would definitely need to be helped to evacuate. And that would again be if you've got a good boss who's talking to you about reasonable adjustments, that would be part of that process. Because any employer is not going to want to have somebody in their building that can't evacuate. Now, if you're working from home, that would need to be considered separately. Um, in terms of what processes there might be for your employer, working from home, loan worker policies and so on. So without boring everyone with policies and procedures, I think this is where this is nothing to do with being autistic. This is about any of us might need help in evacuating the um, premises. Now, for me, for example, when I was recently completing my documentation, I made it quite clear on the form that if somebody said to me, go right and then left, that is a complete no-no for me. I'd end up probably being burnt alive in the building. So if there was things that demanded following left to right um, or following maps that I can't, then I would need help with that. So again, go back to the documentation and this is everybody's right to be able to be evacuated from a building safely. And if people want the forms, then our facilities manager can give those to Chloe and Evie to put on the website. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's great. Um, I don't think we've got anything else at the minute. So if anyone has got anything else to say, just keep them coming in. Um, just something else that we could add actually if any of them, anyone attended the last one that we were talking about the reasonable adjustments and things um in our last axia collective meeting as a group we were discussing whether we think the reasonable adjustments should be put on the website for kind of anyone to look at mm. um and then we discussed whether it should be because the ones that we send, if, if you've had a diagnosis with us, they're personalised. It's got um, the name, the date of birth, the date of assessment and the diagnosis on them. Um, but obviously, if if they're on the website for people to look at, then they won't be able to be personalised. So we had a discussion about that. And we obviously think, it, you know, if people can get reasonable adjustments, then then why deprive them of that? So we want to offer the document to everyone, basically. Um, so if it is now on our website for people to see we've put sample document across it um but just for reference people can see you know the kind of post assessment stuff that um we would give if they come to us and it's got all the information about the new alert cards we've had quite a few um quite a lot actually people get in touch following our um group a few weeks ago asking for the alert cards so we've been sending them out which is great um and some really good positive feedback on that. So, again, oh, if anyone does want any of them, we can get them sent out as well, if you Excellent. didn't last time. Yeah. Um, okay, so something else has just come through. Again, quite a long one, so I'll take a big breath. Um, okay, so I work for the NHS and try to sort out reasonable adjustments. 
I told on the phone to occupational health that I had an autism diagnosis and how it affected me and that I needed an appointment with occupational health doctor. But they said most people with autism don't need an appointment, so I can't have one. I then asked if it could be on my record. I have a disability and they said they'll decide if I'm disabled or not. So frustrating, especially as a senior clinician myself. Oh, dear. Um, well, clearly they're in violation of the Equality Act. And I know it's all very well me saying this, and I'm certain that the person who, you know, is a senior clinician has probably tried all sorts of things. Um, I would say don't give up if you feel that you would want to fight this because you're fighting it not only for yourself, but on behalf of everyone else. I despair of people in the NHS who don't follow policies and procedures. It's a recognised disability under the Equality Act. They do not decide. The Equality Act decides. If you've still got an HR department, and I know the NHS has, uh, you know, put that right back, I would go to the HR department because you could have a claim here as disability under the Equality Act as a discrimination against your disability. It depends how far you want to take this. Um, it might be that if you've got a good manager or there is... Um, a committee in the NHS, I know there used to be things like diversity and equality committees um, that met regularly, um, I would take it there. There is almost certainly an autism partnership board in um, your organisation that under the Autism Act, they have to have an autism partnership board. Now, my experience is that those boards often focus on, um, quite rightly, patients, clients and so on. But I think people forget about staff. I know myself when I worked at a particular organisation and I too asked around um, reasonable adjustments to my disability. And I was told that, and this is a prestigious university, I was told that there weren't any staff with disabilities, that they'd never come across this before. Now, clearly, that is not the case. And I suppose as staff members, if we could lead the vanguard in saying um, we are we are covered by this act too and also it sends very clear messages to patients that there are staff members who have shared the same neurodiversity um, good luck with that one mm -hmm. um, just uh somebody asking about the last session and this session being uploaded so this one will be uploaded to the website usually within the week and um, the one last time that chloe was talking about there is on the website already so if you go on our website and click on news at the top you can either scroll down to find it or there's a search box and if you type in pdsg then that will bring up all the presentations that are on there and you can also sign up to um, receive notifications from your emails whenever you know news or things like that like these videos get posted so you never miss anything so that's I sign up to that as well because I think it's it's really good to yeah. not miss anything yeah it's really good okay another comment somebody saying so many disabled slash neurodiverse people are discriminated against why don't lawyers put out adverts for taking people to court like they do for personal injury claims they could make a fortune by recovering their costs from the guilty party I think the minute there is a test case um that there will be um, solicitors and lawyers doing this. I, I know of a couple of lawyers who are saying that the, they're, what they're waiting for is, you know, a, a huge case to hit the headlines where someone's been discriminated and then it sets case law and then all the solicitors will jump behind it. Um, I think we're close to getting that. Um, but the more of us who try and challenge this, the closer we're going to get to that. And then I think it will be... Uh, lawyers will move, you know, as they do from PPI to whatever the next one. And I think we aren't that far away, I hope, from the Equality Act and discrimination around disability, that more and more is, is coming out around hate crime. Um, I mean, even EastEnders at the moment is just pushing so much, which is absolutely great. Um, but disability is up there and in terms of hate crime and so on. So I think we're, we're getting close. It will need a test case and then there'll be a landslide. I hope I'm still alive to see it. 
Me too. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 thanks. thanks. <laughs> Um, so that's it for now. I'm trying to think if we've got anything else we can discuss. Um, I'm going to make sure I haven't missed any. If anybody does have any questions or comments on anything that has been discussed or not, just a general question or comment, then you can pop that in. Um, I think we've answered all the questions that are in there at the moment. I wasn't expecting this to be a very uh, long, involved um, present. I just wanted to say hello, everyone, belated Happy New Year or whatever, whatever. Um, and just to let you know, we're aware that change is frightening and that uh, we will do our best. If we mis make a mistake, which we invariably will, let us know and we'll try and correct it. We'll do our best. Yeah. And, and any changes that do happen, we'll be letting all of you know, won't we? Yeah, we will. Yeah. We'll and as soon as it's possible to get some decent photos, Dream will be coming back to get some more photos. So they'll, you'll see it taking shape. Mm -hmm. We've had. Um, okay, so I'll, oh, a comment asking about the reasonable adjustments guidance include same posting to access to work. So, yeah, there is a little bit in there um, yeah. about... It, the document's sort of broken down into what a reasonable adjustment is, how to, what you can ask for, how to, how to go about asking for it. And then on the back, there's some useful links. Um, access to work is one of those, for example, but other places that you can go to for more specific information. This is sort of a general guide, but then there are some posts to more specific, whatever it is that you, you need information on. I mean, access to work are very, very good in my experience. Um, the other thing that um, it are, is a good challenge is if any of you have joined a union, which I recommend people do, um, that actually um, a lot of unions are trying to take forward around disability discrimination. So if you feel that you'd like to join a union, the relevant one for your profession, then that's another avenue you can explore. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so if I suppose if there's not much more coming in, then we if we can cut this bit shorter today, it's, it's gone quite quickly, hasn't it? This presentation, yeah. Um, just to, oh, there is something coming through. Okay, so there's a couple of comments. One sort of opened to the group, I suppose. Um, do others feel misunderstood most of the time by others like me? I'm sure people are going to say yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Some comments coming through. Yeah. Um, yes, very. Yes. yes yeah. The time. Yeah, definitely yeah. not not alone with that, I think. Um, Just try and surround yourself with people who you don't have to keep explaining yourself to mm -hmm. when you can. Mm -hmm. um, and then one more about um, access to work again, just been through the process, um, sorry, just been through access to work. The process is straightforward and they're good at making recommendations for autism. Excellent. Um, I think so. I think they're good. And they're a government, you know, they've got government backing and stuff. People can't ignore it. Um, and certainly if anyone's not being given a proper way of evacuating a building, um, then people are going to want to know about that. That's really serious. Mm -hmm. basic health and safety isn't it yeah it's basic health this is nothing to do with autism or neurodiversity this is how we're going to get all these people out of this building alive um so yeah mm -hmm. um so we've got a hand up so i'll just invite this person to um unmute themselves oh where are we oh i can do it oh pretty on here yeah oops Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, Hi uh, yes. Um, I, I I feel moved to share a story, if I may. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, a few days before Christmas, I was in the bank, um, waiting to be served. Um, I had my sunflower lanyard on, and I have a walking impairment, so all you know, I I, I had the markings of um, shall I say disability or you know mm -hmm. uh, 
in some assistance. And uh, the chap that was being served before me was taking ages. Um, so anyway, um, I laughed um, while I was in the queue. Then the cashier who was dealing with the, 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 the man uh, said to me, what are you laughing at? And I said, I'm not laughing at anything. Um, and then he, you know, continued to deal with the customer. When he finished with, with him, I then approached the till and I said, good afternoon. And he said, I'm not serving you. So I said, why not? Anyway, um, I refused to move because I didn't understand why I was not being served. Um, then a colleague came out um, after he went round the back and she said, oh, I can serve you over here. And I said, I need to speak to the manager. Anyway, the long and short of it is I found out before I left that the reason why he refused to serve me was because I laughed. Um, I'm trying to muster up the energy to put a complaint together. I spoke to um, citizen advice, but they don't do um, kind of uh, disability um, discrimination. So I think that the organisation appointment committee was the, the quality advisory. I, I can't get the name, but I've written it down somewhere. So yeah. I had a yeah. long conversation with them and they said, yes, it, you know, I, I, at least I've got um, two things, one harassment and, you know, I was visibly disabled um, and they just decide to ignore it. But but it's it just um, it's just exhausting, actually. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, I'm having issues with my counsel as well. And, you know, I, I was recently diagnosed in August um, um, so, so yes, it has given me more awareness, but it's just, it just, it just feels that society is not, it's just, um, some parts of society, not everybody, it's just very uncaring and unaccommodating really. Mm -hmm. And also we have things like the lanyard scheme, um, that's supposed to raise awareness. And this is a, this is a national bank. And the branch that I went to is supposed to be a flagship, a flagship branch. So it's just very shocking. But I just feel that I'm just kind of um, firefighting, you know, or kind of challenging. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I will find the energy eventually to, to put this together because it's not just about me. It's about us as a community. Yes. Because, you know, I said that to my sibling that I can't let it go. The same with the council. You know, the, I'm down as a vulnerable tenant with the council and yet the service, you know, and, and I just think, you know, it's exhausting, but it's, yeah. a, it's the, 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 the work needs to be done. But I just think people that have gone before me, other autistic people and their voices, what, what's happened to it is, you know, we should be building on these voices, not kind of, yeah. it just feels that, it just feels that sometimes I, we perhaps are starting from scratch in terms of making society a little bit more easier for us. That, that's all I wanted to share, really. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm really privileged that you shared that with us. Um, I think it is about feeling like a lone voice. If you've got the strength, keep going. But one of the things that we like to do with this group um, that used to happen more, I think, that those of you that used to come to the group um, will remember that quite often at the break, there was more sort of mingling there of people who were maybe fighting similar fights. And obviously it's much more powerful when there's several people, several voices, because um, if you're just a lone voice, you can be picked off quite easily. I think sometimes I find that when people get to somebody who's senior enough, then things start to um, change. So clearly there's a training issue there of somebody who interprets laughing in a particular way but needs to be taught that people laugh when they're nervous, people can laugh involuntarily, people can laugh at something internally that other people can't see. So it's about um, a training thing for that person but also as you say it's a national bank and uh, they need to be appraised of this. So if you can have the energy, then um, please keep going.
Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I will. I will. Thank good. You. Good. Hope to hear your um success. Yes, I will. I will share. I will. Yes, please. That'd be lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That comment. Um. Okay. Another comment here, just about the group and how that works. So somebody asking, do we have to send our um date, birth, and assessment sort of information every time there's a new Zoom? Um. No. So for the first time you would join, we'd ask for that information just to um verify who you are basically but then from there you'll be added to a list and you'll get sent the link for every session so you don't need to do that and if you don't want to attend a particular one you can just ignore the email but it just means that once you're on the list you'll get you'll get them all and then you can sort of pick and choose which ones you you want to come to and they all will be um recorded on the website anyway so if you can't make it or don't want to make it for a particular one that's totally fine your call a lot of the time as well, I get asked um, if people can jump in early or like leave early and things like that. And yeah, completely fine. Yeah. Like, um, we can just admit people to it and it doesn't it doesn't disrupt anything, does it? You know, they just um, can attend. And then if, if you need to shoot off for something, that's fine. And as Evie said, if you want to catch up with the rest, it will be on the website and also on our YouTube as well. Okay. Yeah, can't see any more um, questions coming through at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Well, I suppose if there's no nothing else that anybody wants to ask or share, um, then we could wrap this one up a little bit early. Obviously, when this is uploaded, there is the comment section as there is with, with any of the uploads. So if there is sure. something that you want to comment on afterwards, then you can do that there or contact us by email, whatever you prefer. If there's something you think of later, there's a way to, to get in touch, however you decide to do that. So, um, yeah. yeah. I'm just going to check when the next one is, just to let you all know. Is it the... Part. Yeah, so the next one is going to be the 2nd of March, um, same time and a Wednesday like normal. Yep. Um, and there'll be more information to follow about um, the speaker and, you know, the guide like normal. And you'll get the link close to the time. Um, but yeah, as always, if you want to talk to us, as Evie just said, with email or anything, um, but we'll see you back then. Thanks for joining us, Linda, and thanks for the talk. It's a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Okay. We'll see you next time then. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.